with his colleagues, works on a number of islands uh, in Italy looking to eradicate rodents. Thank you, Dario. Um, I am here as uh, the project manager of uh, Life Ponderat, which is uh, just the last one of a uh, uh, long series of uh, uh, project uh, of eradication project uh, on uh, Italian islands. My aim is uh, to uh, discuss and present results, uh, methods, and uh, critical aspects of our project in the last 18 years. Main uh, species, uh, black rat. The black rat is the most widespread mammal in the Mediterranean islands, and uh, we um, eradicate rats for protecting shear waters. Two species, uh, as you can see, uh, both species are threatened by black rat, uh, for uh, rat uh, through rat to predation on uh, chicks and uh, eggs. Um, just to not forget it, uh, it's important to mention that uh, our project were funded by um, a live program, but in some cases, uh, a specific uh, project were funded also by protected areas. Um, at the beginning, we uh, faced uh, small islands because we had no experience uh, of eradicating rats from from islands. So, first islands were very small. Uh, eradication were successful, but the problem was that uh, some of uh, these islands were reinvaded uh, due to the small distance from uh, other islands or mainland. Having gained uh, experience and confidence, we uh, targeted larger islands, such as Giannutri and Zannone. Um, eradication were again successful, no retro invasion, uh, but uh, um, we uh, used a, a mixed distribution in uh, Zannone uh, because the island were, had a very uh, difficult orography, so we were forced to deliver bait in uh, some parts of the island with uh, throwing but, uh, by the helicopter some uh, self-made bay station, bamboo base station which proved uh, to be very effective in our uh, project. And uh, in uh, 2008, uh, we um, uh, eradicated rats from uh, the Molara Islands. This was a, a problematic project because the eradication was successful. It was the first aerial baiting uh, with loose bait with pellets in Mediterranean islands, but the island was reinvaded. We have uh, three uh, clues to understand uh, what happened in Molara. First, the invaders were very different, genetically different from the uh, old population. Second, the islands were uh, too distant from mainland or other big islands with rats. Third, along with rats, uh, uh, rabbits also appeared on the island. So we are uh, keen to the, that the most likely hypothesis is that of uh, a sabotage. And these are the uh, uh, main uh, colonies, uh, main shear water colonies in uh, Mediterranean islands. And um, we uh, eradicated uh, successfully uh, rats from Monte Cristo. Uh, Linosa uh, has to be confirmed, and Tavolara um, is planned rat, rat eradication by aerial baiting in next few months. Um, we stress that uh, positive outcome on uh, this island may, may turn the conservation status of uh, uh, both shearwater spe species. But, uh, Italians uh, um, has a, a big disadvantage to be in Italy. Uh, the problem of being <laughs> uh, working in Italy is that uh, uh, we struggle, for example, for uh, uh, obtaining a derogation for uh, aerial baiting in Tavolara, which is uh, the main world colony of uh, uh, 
here called shear water, and uh, um, we finally obtained the derogation. But the main argument of the health ministry was that uh, the extinction of uh, a species is not a valid reason for granting a derogation. There, there is, as I write, yes, it's a, it's a very interesting argument. Uh, there is a need for uh, awareness raising also in public authorities. This is a main problem that uh, we have in Italy. Just, uh, to, just a few examples of uh, benefits for uh, shear waters during these uh, um, restoration projects. Uh, as you can see, the reprodu reproductive success of uh, shear waters is uh, uh, fairly good when rats are being removed by eradication or by local control in uh, some uh, other cases. The other side of the, of the uh, coin is the impact on non-target species. Uh, as you can see, we uh, had uh, uh, impact at the population level only uh, for uh, nocturnal raptors. Uh, some face of uh, uh, barn owl has, uh, had gone extinct uh, in uh, Giannutri and Molara, but mm, in my opinion it, it uh, would be impossible for them to survive uh, on an island without their main prey, so it will be uh, impossible uh, to survive for them also if surviving to eradication. Uh, feral rabbits uh, have been uh, have gone extinct in uh, Monte Cristo, and it's not necessarily uh, a problem. But uh, um, uh, endemic lizard and geckos uh, uh, showed an increase in their population, uh, so very positive uh, impact for some uh, endemic species. The last challenge is the. Um, Mm, are the island inhabited island? Uh, Ventotene, uh, 700 uh, people, is uh, inside our uh, Pondrat project and Linosa, uh, but uh, we uh, faced some uh, specific problems. The first one is uh, the uh, impact, the problem for pets. Uh, if we have uh, cats or dogs on an island, we can uh, have problem with residents. So we use uh, diff different bait, uh, different active ingredients, uh, bromodialone and difenacum in the first bait uh, distributions and brodifacum in the last two. Uh, the risk for a snail, uh, snail eater, of course people who uh, eat snails uh, may have some problem uh, during the rat eradication. Uh, and uh, uh, we um, managed the access uh, to private properties which are much, which are uh, very important uh, in uh, small inhabited islands to uh, be to have granted the, the, the access uh, we communicate the project uh, in meetings and uh, a key aspect was uh, that we estimated the socioeconomic uh, benefits from rat removal we estimated uh, about 10000 euro per year the savings for uh, from eradicating rats from uh, ventotene and uh, uh, we have shown also that uh, uh, we, are estimate, we are estimating the uh, lowering in the risk of zoonosis for, for people and also for, uh, for pets. And uh, uh, we uh, estimated that about uh, 250 kilograms per year uh, of rodenticide uh, will not uh, be spread in the environment after rat eradication. The result is that uh, everyone in Ventotene is in favor of rat eradication. This is just to uh, show the uh, outcome of our priority list uh, drawn in uh, 2010. Uh, as you can see, many islands have been uh, uh, interested by our project. Um, there is a strange thing in Santo Stefano. Eradication is not necessary because rats in the meantime have, have gone extinct. Maybe they have been frightened by our arrival, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, uh, what we hope to obtain in the next few years with uh, a plan uh, to be confirmed and uh, uh, successful eradication. We estimate to uh, put uh, uh, out to free from rat predation about 70% of both shearwater species. 
Just a few words on uh, biosecurity, my last uh, two slides. Um, uh, we uh, plan to do biosecurity by uh, placing by station in harbors uh, and landing um, points as well as on, on the ships. This is a problem because in Italy and in the European Union, permanent baiting is no longer allowed. So we have to face this problem for granting uh, biosecurity. And this is uh, just my conclusion. Uh, uh, 18 years of lessons, important lessons, because we uh, learned a lot about uh, uh, by our errors. Uh, the first one is the need to uh, communicate also with competent authorities for granting uh, uh, authorization of derogation. This is a very important issue in Italy. And uh, also uh, the need of uh, uh, showing uh, socioeconomic benefits as well as uh, the uh, importance of uh, studying, uh, 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 of relying on different active ingredients when dealing with uh, inhabited uh, islands, uh, so to avoid the problem uh, to pets. And uh, a crucial uh, key aspect is uh, the biosecurity and also awareness rising for stakeholders to avoid problems such as uh, we had in uh, Molara, a voluntary release of rats that uh, was a lot of money uh, spent for rat eradication. I wish to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. We do have time for, uh, for one or two questions, if, if anybody has one. Of the human migration crisis, um, does that bring? Um, sorry, um, the human migration crisis is that adding rats to Italian islands where you don't want them? I, I, I mean, I am not sure to have correctly understood the problem of human migration. All these boats coming to Italy with from Africa? No, we don't know anything about uh, about them. I think that uh, it's a problem out of our control, as you can read uh, from a newspaper. Uh, we think that, uh, however, it could not be a problem because boats are left uh, at uh, many miles from the coast, so I think that uh, rats uh, cannot arrive so close to Italian coasts. Uh, one more. Yes, the snail, uh, snails may accumulate uh, uh, active ingredient, but very low uh, residues. So uh, we think that uh, the problem is, um, is, uh, is not so serious, but we have to manage it to avoid uh, problems with locals. I think that uh, problems for uh, birds uh, or um, other uh, reptiles eating snails, I think that uh, uh, should not be a problem as shown in, uh, in England or in some other uh, environmental impact studies on uh, rodent sites. Thank you, Dario. Um, and our next speaker is Darren Peters um, from the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. Uh, any of you who uh, have been using uh, Dock 150s and 200 traps owe a lot to this man and uh, good nature as well. So uh, I'll leave Darren to take it from there. We'll go. Kia ora tato, everybody. Thanks so much for um, listening to me. It's not my preferred habitat but I'll do my best and hopefully I'm going to try and rip through this and um, have a bit of a discussion or some questions as, um, as, um, as they arise in your minds. Firstly, we'll try and go to Native Island. So that, I think that was Dundee.
I didn't do this, obviously. <laughs> There it is, a tiny little thing, close to Stewart Island, Rakiura Island, in the south. You can see it's quite close to the um, mainland, or the main island. Three species of rat and possums on um, native island and on the mainland. When it's um, neep, or well, you know, dead low, that gap goes down to about 40 metres and the powers are about knee-high knee out of the water. Well, why do we choose this place? Um, this, this good nature technology came on, and I'm trying to, there's, there's a lot of New Zealanders are, we're trying to find out what it can do and how quick it, you know, and, and we're trying to find out fast. So I thought it'd be nice to, to test um, on a vaguely closed system. You know, like there's going to be reinvasion here. Nobody knows how often, but nearby, over, over in the back there, the, 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 the land in the, the far right there is Ulver Island, and that gets reinvaded. We have eradicated that a couple of three times aerially, and now we have a, um, a defence network on that island of Dock 200s on a big grid. And rats get to Ulver a bit, yeah, every couple to three, four years. So we know, you know, rats are going to get back to these places or species are going to get back to these places and I think Sally and the South Georgians or the Falkland Islanders have done some work on really it's just about distance and time. So I wanted to do a couple of things, test whether these things could um, could control, uh, not get the rats down to what we call zero densities and then um, see if we could hold um, what was left at, at that density and also um, see if we could intercept those reinvaders because we're on um, Olver, for instance, our technology at the moment for intercepting these reinvading animals is just single action traps, which you know we have to go back to more often than not. We had um, these are uh, weka. Probably a lot of you know what they are. They're a flightless rail and an endemic to New Zealand, and they. Um, yeah, when we use aerial ops, we usually knock a fair few of those over. So they were a concern to us. And so what, what they did really is force us to modify our, our best practice, the best practice in New Zealand for trapping things, uh, trapping rats down to, um, you know, zero or low densities is sort of 100 metres um, between lines and 50 metres between um, traps. And then, but usually the traps are set on the ground. And um, in this instance, we had to put them up trees which is good, because it um, just um, helped us test the next thing. Yeah, this is a video button. <coughs> I'm sorry. So some of you may not have seen these things work, so there's a few animals getting whacked here. I won't bore you with too long, but it's just to show you how these sort of things work. They set up a tree, animals approach them, and then... Um, so this is on the mainland in a, a site near Wellington, and this, um, these are house mice and rats. And the funniest thing, this, um, this is just a member of the public that's got one in his backyard. Yeah, so. And it's a sequence over a few days, eh? It's just a ship rat. Enough of that. We set up some um, pre-monitoring on both the mainland, a non-treatment site, and on the island. And we use in New, in New Zealand, and you guys, I'm assuming, are all familiar with this method. We use tracking tunnels. We um, put them out sort of... We tried to... We couldn't really be that random on native island, but um, we tried to cover all the habitat. And we... Um, the next shot, yeah, that shows our little island. So the purple, the purple lines are the tracking tunnel lines. The red lines are the trap lines, and the dots are traps at 50 metre spacings. Took um, a volunteer group four days to set the whole thing up, and we'd set our monitoring the month previous to the start of our project. So all the uh, monitoring gear was 
habit, you know, the animals were habituated to that monitoring gear. So we, you know, we have a little rule in New Zealand, if you, if you want to go and monitor rats, you put your gear down and you leave it for three weeks at least, and then go and um, do your first monitor. And um, so, and we just, you know, there is a bit of a difference in there over the years from mainland island work, so that's what we did here. So this is my nice graph. <laughs> so we started the project back in uh, 13, and we were using a static um, lure bottle. And if you want to talk, I've got a couple of the gadgets, if anyone wants to see a gadget in their, in their hands, but... I just wanted to show you these. So there's quite a difference between this portion of the project and this portion of the project over here. The static lure bottles, which was the first um, lure that Good Nature released with their um, trap, really requires for optimum use monthly tap downs because the bottom of the, um, the exposed lure oxidizes and moulds. And to keep it, we assume, Craig Gillies, a colleague, reckons there's not much in it, mouldy bait compared to unmouldy bait, but we, we thought, well, let's take as many variables out as we could, because you know, there's heaps of variables in all of our work. But this was the lure system that took the rats down in a year to that zero tracking rate. So that, that in that non-treatment site, that little black line was on the mainland um, nearby. We left the project alone for a wee while, basically because I had too much on and other things going on in my life. But then I sort of changed it, and I thought, oh, well, rather than... So I didn't visit the island again until the start of um, um, this, um, this here in 16. So who knows? I don't know what the tracking rate was at that point. I just assumed because I hadn't visited the island, the rats would be high. And then we established these gadgets. So these are the next sort of cab off the rank to remove labour. Because the gadget itself resets all the time, so that's great, but it's limited by the lure. So this gadget here, when you activate it, it the theory is it pumps the lure out over six months in tiny little increments. So you always have a fresh layer exposed to the animal. Because we, we tried over and over and over and over and over filling this thing up with... Um, with preservatives and sugar and all the rest of it, just couldn't beat mould, really. So we thought, well, the only way to do that, the only way to beat the mould is then provide fresh lure. And so we sort of changed the project to see if we could um, retain these, these um, densities by visiting the island twice per year and changing the gas and the, um, the lures each time we visited. So the first one seemed all right. You know, we only had a 6% tracking rate. So there was either reinvasion, and I do see sign of Norway rats on the island. And when we first got there, and we were knocking the things down, and you were seeing carcasses before the, um, the Kia had, uh, before the Weka Kia were in my head. There's a whole thing going on at home at the moment with Kia, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, the Weka removed them pretty quick. But um, when we first started, it was ship rats we were seeing. You know, we assume, like on the mainland, you know, the ship rats are pretty dominant in New Zealand, and Norway's occur, and, and, and Kiori occur on Stewart Island as well, but not in the, in the densities that ship rats. So we assume the ship rats hammer them away, but um, the ones that I'm seeing the sign of are, are, are Norway's. And at the second check, you can see it's jumped up to 33% in that second six-month period. And the only thing, just hazarding a guess at it, the locals said the rats went through the roof on the main island, it is beach forest and podocarp mix, so there is a bit of, you know, masting that goes up. There's a little beach on there, Carol. Just a tiny. There's three or four beech trees on my island. And, um, and there was a very wet summer. So the, the locals did. But anyway, it's, it is what it is. So we'll, our next one will be in um, August, September, and we'll see how we've gone at that stage. So oh, yeah, um, Tony said we had to present three key things, so I just wanted to finish off with that. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can knock them down, there's no doubt about that. Um, I don't think they, you know, that the, the island was totally reinvaded. The mainland site 
that we stopped trapping would be back to the 70s, 80s and then following year. And they do require, there's no doubt they require less labour than uh, single action traps. So thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Darren. And we do have time for a couple of questions if anybody has, has any for Darren. On up uh, the side. Hi, do you think these have got potential to completely replace baiting programs in farmland and inhabited island situations to um, move out of this toxic bait scenario? Well I, well, I think they're just another tool, you know. And I, and I know the social stuff, you know. On Rakura Stewart Island, there, there is a bit of an idea about taking all the animal pests off there, or all the predators off there. And it's a social island, you know, like the Italian people have got the social thing as well. So, and I know law, a little bit about what went on on Lord Howe, and, regard, and you'll hear some yarns about that, and, and the social stuff around that. So we just have to... I worked on a, a project in Ka'ina Point on, on Hawaii some years ago, and we used a whole bunch of methods, and some of them were socially um, forced upon us, and some of them were legislatively forced upon us on that site. And they weren't the perfect methods, but we made the methods work. So I think it'll just, like any of these tools that we have, we've relied on aerial distribution stuff because mostly, mostly we're on uninhabited islands and it's a bloody amazing technique. But, you know, it started from, if you look back at the history, a couple of jokers with some bait stations on an island. We didn't launch straight to this high-tech, awesome method we've got now. Yeah. Just got time for one more. Well, they're new, so, but the, the spec in the contract in the early days was to aim for a similar lifespan as a Dock 200, which we assumed a tunnel, a Dock 200 in a tunnel. And the tunnels are, well, the weak, in New Zealand, the, the wooden tunnel is the weak point of that device. And we know that, um, so we just were trying to set some specs for this new tool. And um, so we were talking about 20 years, but what good nature say, if you ask them straight up that question, they'll say, that period, but it can be refurbished if you have issue. Yeah. So at the moment, those traps have been out for five years, and the longest ones I've gotten the scrub are six years, and they still seem to be working all right. But in the, not of the ones that last long. We had lots of failures at the start in the early days of this company. Yeah, oh, the current version, no, that's pretty good. It's a, I think off the, they aim to have about, they've got this fancy-ass pressurising system on their line. So every trap is pressure tested with this real fancy thing that can detect leaks. So they have about a 0.01% failure rate at the end of production. So in the field, I haven't, you know, we hear pretty quick in New Zealand when things are going bad because we all want things to succeed. So we hammer, you know, we all hammer ourselves and we hammer people that aren't, performing. So at the moment I haven't heard any. <laughs> so you get better, eh? But um, as long as you can handle it. Yeah. Now that'll be a question. If you've got, that's it, eh? Thanks, Darren. And, uh, Thanks so much. Hopefully a few people want to play with your gadgets later. Uh, our next speaker is uh, a colleague of mine from RSPB, John Kelly, and uh, he'll be uh, addressing mouse eradication on Gough Island. Okay, uh, good to go, can everyone hear me? Uh, first of all, I'd just like to shout out to some of my fellow authors on this. So uh, Claire Stringer, who's somewhere in the audience, Keith Springer, um, just there, and Trevor Glass, who's also ba who's based on Tristan de Kuna, a member of uh, Tristan de Kuna government. So where is Gough Island? Um, it's in the middle of the South Atlantic, basically halfway between uh, the African continent and the South American continent. It is a British overseas territory. It is governed by uh, Tristan de Kuna, which is a small island community of um, about 300 um, people. Um, it is uh, designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's recognized as at risk due to invasive species. 
um, primarily as invasive species. And it is recognized in that citation as one of the most important seabird colonies in the world. It is an island of volcanic origin, uh, so it's basically an extinct volcano in the middle of the ocean. Uh, it has steep cliffs around the coast, uh, rising to a rather mountainous and rugged interior. It is uh, uninhabited um, as per the def definition given yesterday, uh, apart from a weather station that is operated by the South African government and the South African Weather Service. Um, the only way to get to Gough uh, is via this vessel, the Agullus II, which uh, goes to Gough um, every September, um, drops off a, a new team, takes away the old team, leaves them there for 13 months before coming back again, again and doing the whole thing over again. If you do happen to turn up on a vessel, uh, which is, there are very few and far between opportunities, you get to jump on one of these and get up onto the island. There's no port, there's no air facilities apart from the uh, helipad that you saw in the photograph. Uh, as I said, incredibly important for seabirds. Here we see uh, the great shearwater coming in in the evenings. This was a photograph taken by uh, one of the team that we place on island every year at the moment. Um, and she's just showing millions of great shearwaters coming in to land at night time. It is home to Britain's only two critically endangered uh, bird species. So here you see the Tristan albatross and, and the Gulf bunting. Um, back in 2003, uh, everyone will, may, may remember the grainy footage of mice uh, predating on uh, Tristan albatross chicks. At that time, we didn't really know that the mice were um, killing the albatross. We knew they were weakening them and they were contributing to the decline. Our technology has got better. We have less grainy footage, but the uh, images are no less gruesome. Um, unfortunately, the species is heading for decline um, due to mouse predation and um, impacts at sea, which are being managed uh, through BirdLife's uh, Albatross Task Force work. But as you can see here, the breeding success for the Tristan Albatross on Gulf is um, much lower than expected, and the trajectory is towards extinction. This is where the RSPB and our partners uh, stepped in to address the issue. We commissioned a feasibility study um, to identify if it was possible to eradicate mice from the island. At no point prior to this had anybody considered eradicating mice from such a large island in, in, in the middle of the ocean, and especially on a UK territory. Uh, John Parks, who's in the audience, I believe, uh, he uh, led on that feasibility study. He identified that it will take a ship to get everything to the island, obviously. Uh, they will drop everything onto the island, uh, they will operate from the island for over the winter months. They will drop uh, bait across the island as per the methodology that you've all seen during the last couple of days. Uh, using um, techniques developed in New Zealand, so you have the uh, modified agricultural fertilizer spreader. One issue that we have to deal with on Gough is we have the Gough bunting I mentioned and we also have the Gough moorhen, two endemic species that may be impacted by the baiting program. So we need to design mitigation measures for these two species, taking them into captivity uh, and protecting them for the duration of the operation itself and uh, uh, releasing them only when we've identified that the environment is safe to do so. So this increases the complexity uh, around the operation. We need a baiting team and we need people suitably qualified to look after these birds um, for, the, for the entire time. Uh, in that feasibility study I mentioned, a number of issues had to be addressed. Um, could mice, so it's, as I said, it's a volcanic um, mountain or volcanic island, so there are a number of uh, caves. So will mice that are living in these caves come out and have access to bait? We're able to identify that this is, this is not a serious issue uh, and we can proceed based on that. We looked at bait preference and toxicity of mice, so we looked at that and ensured that mice are susceptible to bradyphagum and there's no um, resistance built up in the population. Uh, again, we looked at protecting non-target species. This work is largely complete, but we, it requires a supporting project during the operation itself. A lesson from the Henderson operation, which um, uh, we applied to Gough, is not all islands are the size that it says on the map. 
Um, so on Henderson, uh, the island was thought to be 3,700 hectares. Uh, it is actually for, oh, I've got my numbers wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Henderson is 600 hectares larger than what it's stated on maps and also in a completely different location. So we needed to uh, reaffirm uh, the size of the island and everything about it. So we use satellite telemetry, we use helicopters, so we map the island and we know the size of the island and can target our baiting operation appropriately. Uh, we also needed to know if we can get bait onto the cliffs at the required level. And through a study completed in 2013, we uh, addressed that issue and we now have confidence that we can get bait onto the island. However, uh, while all of this work was going on, other work was going on. This is Henderson Island, which we've spoken about. Uh, the RSPB mounted an operation in 2011 uh, to eradicate um, Radis excellence from the island. This failed um, for reasons that were discussed um, earlier th this morning, and we're working to get back towards Henderson. But this impacts on um, other operations and impacts on confidence to proceed with complex operations. So we're working through Henderson and working through Gough, we, we are seeing that. On the flip side, there are a number of positives. Here we see Keith Springer winning his award for uh, the management of the Macquarie Island pro uh, project, pest eradication project. This was a groundbreaking project and one that the RSPB looked at as a model for golf. Um, we also saw the South Georgia Habitat Restoration Project, a truly inspirational effort with all of those involved. And, and it, it showed what can be completed in complex environments um, if you but your mind to it. Meanwhile, all of this going on in back in golf, our monitoring efforts are still going on. We are looking at the impact of mice on uh, nesting seabirds. Uh, and it, unfortunately, the birds are just going in the wrong direction. We've also recently noticed uh, a new behavior that um, was first identified on Marion Island. Uh, a year later, we identified it on Gough Island, and it's also been identified now on Midway Atoll, where the mice are scalping the, the young chicks. Um, in, su in summary of the impact of the island, uh, a lot of the breeding seabirds, especially those winter wintering, um, uh, breeding over winter, are just going downwards. Uh, the broadbill prion McGilvery's prion was a new species discovered on uh, nesting on Gough, 15% uh, breeding success in some years, some years much lower. But in total, we have estimated that over 900,000 seabirds are killed annually by mice um, on Gulf Island. Enter the Gulf Island Restoration Program. Um, this uh, is a program obviously designed to eradicate mice and also but in place all of the other supporting structures needed to successfully deliver this uh, program. Uh, 7.6 million pounds uh, estimated budget uh, at the start of the program. Um, and we've, we've initiated our fundraising efforts and I can report that we have uh, a number of success. So in total from the UK government, we've two million pounds received. We have uh, two million US dollars from the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation. And we're getting generous donations and support from individuals and foundations. I would like to acknowledge uh, those in UK government and NIFWIF uh, who have spearheaded bringing the golf program through their, their structures because they've brought a lot of confidence to other funders and, and it really helped capitalize, uh, catalyze the project that we're working on. We have uh, done preparatory work, so Keith, uh, Claire and myself have been leading on this. So trying to identify the logistics uh, required for the operation. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview. And we're continuing the baseline monitoring on island and doing some studies to inform the environmental impact assessment that will be required before we mount the operation. So our current timeline is um, we are aiming for an operation in um, uh, the austral winter of 2019. To get to that, we have to put in place measures, um, measures over the next year or so. So Keith and uh, a pilot will hopefully visit Gough um, in this year. They will undertake some identification work. That will inform our strategy over 2018, where we deploy infrastructure in flat pack to the island, um, which will then be built in uh, 2019 before the baiting crew arrives. So a lot of logistics to get right in order to deliver this operation, because we don't want the baiting team to turn up and then have to build the infrastructure and prepare the island. So there's a bit of work to do. 
There are a number of program challenges, so I'll just pull out some key ones because the light is going orange. Um, this is the first operation of this type that has been proposed to be based out of op uh, uh, South Africa. So we have a lot of jurisdictions to work through, and that's um, a bit, bit of a tricky issue. There's also a change in regulatory environment. So the regulatory environment back in 2003 has changed dramatically across a number of sectors. So health and safety, uh, we have to increase our health and safety efforts to comply with regulation. Aviation regulations have changed, so some of the restrictions that were in place at the start of, start of this planning process uh, are brand new not right now. And regulations for the charity sector in the UK are changing all the time, and we all have to operate within that. Um, the fundraising environment, so if you just pull that out, the UK overseas territories are incredibly important for UK biodiversity. However, uh, they don't necessarily fall in the remit of many international uh, funding organizations. So it's, it's a hard uh, job to actually encourage those organizations to support some of those efforts. Um, the stakeholder engagement process is um, a bit tricky. Um, and I will say that part of that is um, the perceived risk to the Tristan economy. It is a small island um, that derives most of its income from uh, fisheries, um, and there is a perception of risk to that fishery. Now, there's no limited evidence from all of the projects that we've seen around the world that um, the baiting operation will impact on the fisheries. We have to carefully manage this, and that is one of the main challenges. Um, and I will just blank to the screen. Uh, finish with some acknowledgements of some key people. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, have time for a question. If anybody has one for John. Looks like you got okay, I got off lightly. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And. Uh, I'd like to introduce Guy Preston, our next speaker. Uh, Guy is the uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Environmental Affairs in South Africa, uh, which has a, a broad remit for invasive species and uh, is going to address us on Marion Island. Thank you, Guy. It's Guy Preston. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for the privilege of being here. I, as has been suggested, uh, mentioned, I'm Guy Preston from the uh, National Department of Environmental Affairs. But this is a, a partnership uh, in terms of the presentation with one or two other authors, many of whom are in the audience and, and who will play a huge role in the work that we're intending to do. Just to put our invasive work into perspective, uh, Invasive species are the single biggest threat to South Africa's very rich biodiversity. We are the third richest in the world, apparently, in terms of biological diversity. Just on the Table Mountain chain in, Ta in Cape Town, we have more than 2,300 species. Uh, to put that in perspective, more than the entire British islands uh, and about the same as New Zealand. And it can be replaced by just a few invasive species uh, and until our efforts uh, was being replaced by a few invasive species. It's also invasive plants are a huge problem in terms of water. Uh, on the left there you have uh, a lake or a dam that's, that's feeding uh, Pretoria, the city of Pretoria, with water. About 40% of that water is lost to evapotranspiration because of the water hyacinth. But even worse is, are the pines on the, on the mountain slopes and those will effectively dry up uh, our, our, our rivers and wetlands and destroy agriculture uh, in the area. Uh, we also have huge problems with many of these plants being born to burn and uh, so huge fires are associated with them and then the consequence of erosion, siltation, uh, mudslides and loss of productive land. So in 1995 we started what we called the Working for Water program to co control invasives. It's now grown to 14 programs that I manage, uh, employing 97,000 people. Uh, and we do have done initial and follow-up, so we have to keep going back to the land, on over 3 million hectares of land. Uh, and our annual budget in terms of pounds is about 120 million pounds, uh, out of a total budget of 200 million. But in reach, you could probably double that in terms of, of what we can do with our currency, the RAND. The return on investment I've just put in here that, that uh, some scientists looked at some of the work that we're doing and they said for the money that we spent, the return on investment they calculated at 27 billion pounds 
uh, and that's just for water grazing and biological diversity. So we do a lot of efforts around trying to, to show the value of the work that we do, and we're trying to extend it by looking at innovative ways to, to deal with the invasives, and as a result of that, be able to take our money and use it for the priority things of prevention, early detection, biological control, and high altitude work. Uh, so we, we started making coffins out of, out of invasive biomass. Uh, we've put over half a million uh, children behind school desks. That's my office, all made from invasive biomass. Uh, we are now building houses. We have a shortage of 2.1 million houses, people living in shacks uh, in our country. And what we did is we did a little experiment where where uh, we tried to burn down that house in the background and, and we surrounded it by, by, with shacks and set fire to them. These houses are made from effectively invasive biomass. Uh, we hoped that the one in the middle would not burn because we had treated that one as well. And that was the result of what happened. So we have a huge potential to take the Department of Housing's budget to clear our invasives to, uh, to build these houses and therefore take our budget up into the mountains or indeed to kill rats. Uh, the high altitude work is a huge issue for us. Uh, this is some work that Peter Ryan did on Inaccessible Island. It took uh, two of our high altitude team 12 hours to kill eight plants because they were dangling down these, these thousand foot cliffs. Uh, we have a biosecurity Laws, I'm responsible for that as well in our country, and those are the different taxa that we are dealing with. You can see a very big emphasis on plants in what we're doing, but I think you all know that microbes are the, are the real long-term threat uh, in terms of, of invasives. We haven't eradicated anything ourselves. In fact, there has been a snail and then the cats on Marion Island that have been eradicated. We will eradicate eventually the Himalayan tars. John Parks has been giving us some advice on that. And the, the house crows from India, uh, we are very close to eradicating them as well. Um, and if we don't eradicate them, they will spread up the west coast of Africa with very serious consequences. On Marion Island itself, we've been working on eight, eight different plants uh, and wood loss. Uh, my colleagues tell me that we've eradicated uh, three of the plants. Um, I don't believe it, but but uh, I left it up there in deference to them. There are a number of plants that we haven't worked on, but the big thing that we're here for is, is of course, the mice. And we've been talking about doing mice for a long time, but the, the step up to do that has been more than we were capable of until very recently. South Africa's Prince Edward Islands were annexed in 1948, uh, home to 28 species, 44% of all wandering albatrosses, 25 of sooty, and 10 of grey-headed. Mice were accidentally introduced uh, by cedars in the early 19, uh, 1800s, but su surprisingly not to Prince Edward uh, Islands. Cats were then introduced in, a, in a, uh, a fit of extreme stupidity, and, uh, and they managed to kill uh, 4,500 petrels each year, according to the stats, 2,000 cats that were uh, built up the numbers to 2,000, and then we had Rambo-type people going along to, to shoot them all, and we did eradicate the cats uh, on, on Marion. The, the burying petrels, if you compare it to Prince Edward Islands, uh, 20 times more on Prince Edward Islands, and since the, the, the cats have been eradicated, the numbers have not increased, and that indicates that something is keeping them from... Uh, from increasing, which of course is, is the mice. The mice densities themselves have gone up very seasonal, as you'd know. Invertebrate uh, biomass is, has collapsed, and as a result of that, the mice in winter are looking for other sources of food. And uh, so this is a bit of gory, gory stuff uh, of a scalping uh, taking place. Scumbi's uh, video, by the way, I should have acknowledged it. So, uh, 
Uh, infrequent but increasing attacks since 2003 have been noted and recorded by various scientists. About 5% of sooty, grey-headed and light-mantled albatross ticks killed by mice in 2015 was the uh, expectation. Uh, the, the attacks do occur all around the island. Uh, the burrowing <coughs> petrels in particular are being, are being hit by the, by the mice. And left alone, the mice will almost certainly extirpate uh, petrol populations over time on, on Marion. Uh, for quite some time, people have been postulating the possibility of dealing with the mice on, on Marion. Uh, and various scientists like Peter Ryan, uh, Stephen Chan, Ross Wanless, and Ben Diddy, all of them part of the co-authors here, have been advocating this. And eventually, BirdLife South Africa published a re review by Dr. John Parks uh, where it was con concluded that it is indeed feasible. Uh, then things happened very quickly. Uh, Frederick Paulson was part of the ACE uh, uh, expedition that some of you would have been on. And, and between Peter Ryan and others, and, and uh, we have John Kelly in the foreground there t uh, too, uh, I got a phone call saying, would we like the helicopters um, that were so, so eulogized yesterday in that wonderful talk by Tony. And, uh, and of course, that was something we couldn't turn down. Uh, and that was a catalyst then to, to set up a real uh, attempt to deal with, with, with the, the problems on, on Marion. Uh, so we have said that the helicopters, or uh, Frederick Paulson said the helicopters must be made available for golf in 2019, and that will do, along hopefully with it being able to faci facilitate the, the ships uh, getting things to and from uh, Gough Island. In the interim, what we'll do is use the helicopters for conservation work. Uh, so rhino poaching, as I'm sure you all know, is a big issue in our country at the moment, um, and the various monitoring work and other anti-poaching work uh, we'll be using these helicopters for that purpose until we, we then take them to Gough. As was mentioned by John, there is a weather station on Gough Island, and if it's possible for us to rebuild that station, there's, there's talk of it moving to Tristan. Uh, I think that would help to enhance uh, the partnership between Britain and South Africa uh, in having the, that, that presence, which... Not everyone agrees with me, but my sense from a biosecurity perspective, um, having control over what comes, the risk of things coming onto the island is, is important. Now, we dare not fail, as you've all been saying, it's a once-off opportunity. Uh, we hope to build on the experience uh, of all the various things that have gone on. We know that we, we don't have to be the experts. There are great experts from New Zealand and elsewhere who can help uh, guide us on these things. Whoops, we understand that, that pilots matter. Uh, I've, with uh, working on fire program, I have 36 pilots, so I'm already in awe of pilots and then yesterday's videos and this kind of thing of, of, of just how, how complex this, this work is. We will make sure that we employ the best people that we can to do, to do the work. Uh, from John's uh, studies, it looks like we're gonna have to go in early winter uh, this is a really important side of what I have uh, left. Uh, I asked the scientists, of the 27 species on Marion Island, how many of them are vulnerable to, to being extirpated by, by mice? And it's two-thirds of the species. And it is, with my knowledge of, of mainland species where we, where we have a great deal of experience, it is an inevitable outcome. Uh, that the vast majority of these species will be extirpated if you just leave them and do nothing about the mice. So stitch in time really saves time. We've budgeted 1.8 million, uh, and the night is red, so I'm going to have to stop. But those were the concluding comments, along with the need for, for, for biosecurity going on. And uh, the Captain Scott is just... Uh, because I'm related to Captain Scott, so I thought I would yeah. take advantage of that. Uh, 
we do have time for uh, for one question if any, anybody has one. Thank you. Um, so John Park, who was mentioned a, a number of times this morning, is our next speaker, and uh, I'd like to welcome John, uh, an ex-land care research scientist from New Zealand, uh, currently in uh, some form of retirement where he, he works quite a bit, um, and also going to address us on Marion Island. No, thanks, Keith. Um, we've heard on several speeches uh, and earlier on this morning from Keith Broom about the uh, uh, best practice as it's evolving for mice and other rodents on temperate and on tropical islands. Um, best practice, of course, is not a recipe, and uh, the dock people are very keen to point out that it is not a recipe, that you've got to think for yourself on your own islands. Uh, so I got... Um, brought in to have a look at a feasibility study to get rid of mice on Marion Island. Uh, and one of the issues that crops up on these things is what's the best time of year to drop your baits. Uh, past best practice from the Department of Conservation was essentially to drop the baits in late winter, early spring. But really the, the, um, the rationale for that is you want to drop the baits when the mice or the rodents are hungriest when there's least food per mouse. A couple of little shots of the island. Great island, gazillions of birds and pinnipeds and uh, other things. Only a couple of uh, um, terrestrial birds, really, the sheath bulls, and there's uh, uh, Laris dominicanus, a subspecies of the uh, kelp gull there. So, uh, planning progress, is it justified? Yes, well, there's been several studies by uh, Andrea Angel and John Cooper, and reinforced by shots you've seen of the devastation on the, on the albatross chicks. Uh, it was mentioned before that the mice have collapsed the biomass of uh, invertebrates on the island, um, which is interesting, and it is presumably down to mice. They've gone down by uh, a biomass decline by nearly 90%. And it is presumably due to mice because it hasn't happened on the mouse-free um, Prince Edward Island next door. So that's a, a clear need. And the other, whoops, what have we done? We seem to have skipped a whole lot there. No, no, well, um, red and claw, we've seen that, and it's been mentioned for goff and now on albatross on the midway. This is learned behaviour of mice, and, but whether it's driven, the learning is driven by hunger, we don't really know. So, getting back to my theme, one issue, what time of year to bait? Conventional wisdom from the uh, uh, Department of Conservation in New Zealand is do it when food is scarce, there's no breeding, rodent densities are lowest, and many of the non-target seabirds are absent, which sort of uh, indicates in the winter. But, in these sort of islands, at those latitudes, day, daylight short, flying time's restricted, one day and six on South Georgia, weather's generally horrible, um, and logistics are often diff difficult. Um, I'll skip through this, it just shows you in the bottom bit of this graph um, that, it, that daylight is short, so flying hours are short, and if, even when you get a good flying day, it's not many hours to do a lot of work on these bigger islands. It's difficult. So why not bait when conditions for flying are better is a question you could ask. And we do have precedents. Mice were got rid of on Enderby Island, south in, in Auckland Island, south of New Zealand, uh, baited in January, in the middle of summer, uh, the target was rabbits and it was indicated that uh, that was the time of year when they weren't breeding and that's when we should go for them and they sort of accidentally got rid of the mice at the same time. South Georgia we've just seen and hopefully the mice on the Nunez Peninsula have been eradicated and that was done in that um, late summer, um, early autumn period because it was knee deep in snow the rest of the year, so it was a, a snow issue. Um, the, the French Southern Territory Islands, mostly in the Kerguelen groups, were baited in summer, uh, um, largely I think because of ship logistics. It was when the Marion de Friends, the, the French supply vessel, could get down to the islands, and they succeeded on some islands and failed on others. So some variable um, outcomes of, of precedent, using precedent to judge these things. Marion Island mice have a distinct breeding season, which is good, and so you have to test this because not all um, southern and temperate island mice have 
uh, breeding season. I think on uh, Steeple Jason in the, in the Falklands they don't. Um, and they can certainly breed all through winters in New Zealand when there's plenty of food around, at, even at higher altitudes. So um, cold and, and uh, day length and things does not stop mice necessarily breeding. So what are they eating? Uh, getting to the, to the crux of the matter really, well, um, diet studies showed that invert, uh, Mar Marion has a great advantage is because generations of South African students have gone down there and done their masters and PhDs on all sorts of things on the island. So it's a very data rich um, uh, area to work in. So mice are eating uh, the endemic moths in particular, Pringlophagia moths, uh, a bit of plants, beetles, earthworms, they seem to have wiped out the spiders, uh, mice really do like spiders. The seasonal abundance of mice, uh, that's been measured on many occasions down there in various habitats. And you can see it, uh, it matches their breeding season. They uh, reach a peak in, uh, in May, April, May, and then it declines when breeding stops and then increases again. So uh, most mice in April and May. If we look at the seasonal abundance of food, well, there isn't much variation seasonally. Uh, these things are, are the the top ones, the total and the bottoms are, are moths and weevils and I forgot what the other one, but, it, but there's not a huge variation that you might expect in other temperate uh, mainland forests. So what this gets us to of course is that uh, mouse density uh, versus food availability, so we know what they, uh, the difference in mouse density is in an early summer before the breeding really starts, it's very low, 43 very low relatively, that's a high density of mice, very low in the early summer, uh, maximised in the early winter. The invertebrates are much the same, uh, so the per capita food supply is, is worst for the mice in early winter. And it actually improves a bit after that, so despite the fact that the mouse densities um, decline a little bit, or decline a lot when breeding stops, they're actually fattest in the winter when there's least mice around. And one possible explanation for that is cannibalism. You put a dead mouse out and the other mice eat it within a day, uh, which is an indication of protein shortage and perhaps why they're flicking into eating the birds, I don't know. Mice are used to eating dead birds because the skewers and things litter the place with bits and pieces of birds and the mice nibble on that, so it might be part of the learning behaviour. Winter cannibalism. Hmm. So my main conclusions then, that there's little seasonal change in invertebrate biomass. So food per mouse is lowest when mice are at peak densities in March and May. Uh, mice are fattest when they're at the lowest densities, which is sort of counterintuitive to some extent in winter and spring, and they stop breeding in April, May. So it seems to me that uh, baiting in April might be a good compromise between day length flying and flying time, the hungriest mice on Marion Island, right at the end of their breeding season. Um, so, and I think it was Keith Broom or somebody, uh, one or earlier speaker anyway, raising the issue is we don't really know what the role of semi-independent rodents in their nests are in terms of uh, survival of, a, of a aerial baiting. And I think that's a bit of a gap in our research knowledge. So if that was important, then perhaps May might be a better month uh, to do the baiting on Marion Island. Uh, so there are some issues. Now, I see, uh, and I can't remember whether I uh, did the, uh, explored this, Gough Island, we have a lot less information on, on mouse biology. And I can't remember from way back whether I actually explored this seasonality issue as far, but I see the planning is to do the baiting um, as they did on Macquarie and Antipodes and other islands uh, into the winter and I just raise it as a consideration that it might be better to do it uh but that's something that I think uh, that um, John Kelly and others are going to have to explore and just think about a bit. might not make any difference it apparently, fingers crossed, worked in the uh, winter baiting on the Antipodes islands um, for the mice down there so we shall see Again, it gets back to the, my introduction that, uh, that there isn't a recipe. You need to think through each island as you go. And uh, who knows where these mice will stop. These are the local orcas, and you can see somebody has been nibbling them. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it there.
got some questions at this time. Some questions? Why they're a problem for the birds? Yeah. yeah. So I suspect it's because um, the invertebrate fauna and that collapse of 90% of the biomass um, uh, has driven the mice to find alternative prey. Look, only occurred only on Gough Island. It was very patchy. It wasn't all of the. It's like it was a cultural thing going through generations of mice that corner, nothing was touched. Um, and certainly on Marion Island, I mean, and certainly on the surface nesting birds, this predation wasn't abandoned gazillions of birds there, and it really only started to kick in a few years ago. Uh, really, um, less. Appears to be a the mice. Speculate it's uh, as I say if it's uh, um, lack of uh, lack of net of an inverted introduce one. Sets uh, it's, it's really an island. Uh, since the cats, well, the, since the cats were, but e even well after that, they're still increasing. There's a bit of a syndrome, of course, because the climate's warming there. The southern islands. All sorts of. Any other questions for John? Richard. You may not be able to answer. How quickly would that behaviour be transmitted through? Uh, well, I see um, um, Guy had some more recent uh, distributions of the thing, and it was uh, right around Marion Island. And I'm not quite sure on Gough when I was there, and that was a good few years ago now. Um, that was very patchy, and so uh, that. That patchiness, because the mice aren't going to live all those years between hands, so it's clearly, a, if it is a learned behaviour, it's culturally transmitted to their offspring uh, and not to the neighbour's offspring around the corner. Uh, it's a fascinating problem, I don't know. I think, that, I think it's patchy on Midway too. For, uh, uh. Any last questions for John before we move on? Okay, thanks very much, John. And uh, timing wise, we're doing okay. Um, and our last speaker for this session, I'd like to introduce Evaristo Rojo from uh, Mexico. And uh, if I could uh, take the liberty of paraphrasing his talk, uh, what it's like to develop a nerd. Hi. Yes. <coughs> Hi everyone, I want to uh, share with you a tool that we developed. Uh, here it, it has been useful for us and maybe it could be useful for you as well. Um, first a little bit of context. Uh, uh, our group has carried out 60 mammal eradications on 39 Mexican islands. 60 of them have been of rodent, rodent eradication and seven of them have been by means of aerial dispersal. So here you have the 39 eradications in the green dots. This has been rodent eradications, and these seven has been uh, aerial 
uh, dispersal eradications. Uh, this tool that I'm going to, uh, to talk about, we have used in these uh, islands and in this one too. The other one have been, uh, we used the methods that we used before we developed this tool. So you know that aerial broadcast of raw and bait is one of the preferred methods for rat eradication when it's convenient. Here, uh, there is a picture, this picture is uh, from Banco Chinchorro, this, this one here. And, well, there are some challenges uh, uh, in the using aerial broadcast of rodenticide. The first one is that creating the uh, bait density maps is slow. And the second one is that taking in situ measurements is difficult. Uh, accessing this part of the island, uh, it could be challenging, considering that it's, uh, it's all underwater and there are uh, cocodriles there, and we don't want to uh, bother them because they are fragile. So, so I'm going to show you how we used to do things before we developed the tool, okay? This is not how we do it right now, it's how we used to do it. So we do this uh, map, uh, the area covered, uh, and we assume a constant bay density uh, in the whole area. We did uh, maps of the speed of hel the helicopter, and we have to assume that the helicopter travel in a constant velocity within each uh, bait swath, and combining uh, the area and the, and the speed of the helicopter, we calculated, we used to calculate this uh, uh, map uh, density, density of, uh, map density of, of bait, uh, but the assumption here is that within each bait uh, swath, the density is constant. So here is the tool that I want to share with you. Uh, there you go. Uh, here, uh, this is schematics. You, this represents the bait swath. You can see the mouse, yes. So this uh, letter sigma represents the bait density uh, as a function of x. x represents the distance between the middle of the, of the swath width and the, and the point where you are evaluating the density. Uh, w represents the swath width. Uh, the M with a dot on top represents the, the flow, the massive flow of, uh, of bait in kilograms per second. And the S represents the speed of the helicopter. So what I'm saying here is that the integral of the uh, density is equal to the ratio of the flow mouth, the the flow, uh, the flow rate uh, divided by the speed of the helicopter. This is really interesting because uh, the, the helicopter t it takes, well, the GPS of the helicopter takes one point. There is one point here and one point here every second, let's say. So for every, for every second, you can think the, of the speed of the helicopter as a constant and the aperture diameter of the, or the flow mass of the bucket is constant too, so this thing on the right, uh, the right hand side of the, of the equation is constant, so you have an, this integral on the left hand side, so this is a probability density function, and this gives you a lot of freedom to choose uh, to which uh, function you want to fit to the profile. So the, the formulation of this uh, equation, you can find it in the proceedings, I won't, I won't bore you with that. So the, we call this uh, model the numerical estimation of rodenticide dispersal, dispersal, or NERD for short. And this tool facilitates the planning of the helicopter work, generates bait density ma maps uh, automatically, instantly, and allows for instant identification of bait gaps with less in situ measurements. So the first thing you have to do to be able to use this tool is to calibrate the tool. So we measure, we fill the bucket with uh, bait, and then we take the time that it takes to empty. So we can cal calculate, uh, and we do this experiment for different aperture uh, diameters. So we can get this uh, graph. So we have here in the vertical axis the flow rate in kilograms per second, and in the horizontal axis the aperture size. Here we have five uh, different uh, experiments, 
and then here we fitted a model, it's just a quadratic. So we can, we, can, we can have the same simplification that we used to do before. We can assume a constant bait density uh, within each uh, uh, bait swath. So the previous case is actually a particular case of this general equation. And here we can see that the density uh, is a function of the aperture diameter of our bait bucket. And it's just the ratio of these two linear density and the width of the, of, the, of the swath. So we can still make the same calculations that we did before, and this is good for planning. For instance, our pilot likes flying at 35 uh, knots, and we, let's say, use an, as an example that we are targeting, we, we expect to get in the, in the, on the ground a density of uh, eight uh, kilograms per hectare. Here we have two, these two axes, the horizontal and the vertical axis, are actually the independent uh, variables. So here in the color axis, you see, you see the bait density. So if we want, uh, uh, if our pilot likes flying at 35 knots and we want to get uh, eight kilograms per hectare uh, density, then we know that we have to use our uh, uh, aperture diameter of, of 75 uh, millimeters. So this is good for planning. Uh, but we can use the model to, to go a little bit further, and we don't need to think that the helicopter actually flies at a constant uh, speed because, because it doesn't. Uh, so we can uh, make a, the assumption that the, that the speed actually varies, and then we can cal calculate the density as a function of the aperture uh, diameter and the speed of the helicopter with this uh, model that I showed you before of the, of the flow uh, mass as a function of the density uh, divided by the product of the speed and the SWAT width. So here, the, this represents uh, the, the bait, width, the bait uh, SWAT, and then we have higher density and lower density depending on the speed of the helicopter. Still, we are simplifying the model because it's constant across the, the, uh, the bait swath. Uh, but the truth is that in reality, the helicopter, uh, the, the amount of bait that is right on the bottom of the helicopter is bigger than that it is on, on the side. So we don't have to assume that it's constant across, and we, we can assume that it's a variable uh, bait density uh, along and across each dispersal swath. Here I assume a symmetrical uh, uh, distribution of the bait density being uh, higher on the middle and lower on the sides. But our experiments show that it's not actually symmetrical. Here we have in the vertical axis the bait density, and in the horizontal axis the distance from the fly path. So this is a profile of the, of the bait density. You have, you have to imagine the a helicopter flying uh, through, the, through the border. And here this, this is the ground, and we measure the, the bait density uh, different distance from the flight path. And we, we found that there is actually less uh, bait as if you go farther from the right of to the left, uh, you, you can find less uh, bait. And in the middle is more, but it's not, it's not symmetrical. Of course, you can see a lot of sto sto stochastic variation here, but uh, let's just assume that there is some pattern there. So we can use the full uh, model that I showed you early here. And the interesting thing here is that you can fit any uh, uh, density, uh, probability density function. Of course, like if the integral, it gives you one, but the, here the integral, it gives you this uh, ratio. So the thing is, you don't have to worry about this equation. Just plug it in the computer. Uh, we did that, and you just, you just run it. And this is the new, uh, this is Banco Chinchorro, uh, the, or, uh, Laser eradica eradication, and you can see here that you don't have constant uh, swap width. You have you have a variation here, and here we choose like four four uh, categories. But actually, this is a decision that someone make because this is actually continuum, right? So we can find gaps narrow the finite defined as uh, below uh, or target density. 
So as a conclusion, this tool uh, allows for better planning. It automati uh, the automatization of log processes, meaning the calculation of density maps, now it takes seconds. Uh, is instant identification of bay gaps and efficient use of uh, resources. So this tool was developed thanks to our uh, growing network of partners. And I will take any question. There is a question over there. What is the height? Do you guess it's going to be high over the grind? Does that affect it? You know, that is the, always the first question. <laughs> yeah, that's always the first question. And I don't put it there because I know it, was, it will be the question. It's a good question. And I think that the SWAT width is related with that. But the, and we can use any uh, density profile and some of the parameters used to modify the SWAT width. I think that's the next step. The only problem is that the experiments, the experiments that are, you, you have to use a helicopter, right? So uh, we haven't had the chance to, to vary the, the height. And I think the second question I always get is about the, the slope. Uh, and I think this question and the slope question are related, and I think you can vary the, the width of the swath. Uh, uh, just, uh, you just need to do the experiments to do that in the same way we did the experiments for the, for the, for the profile of density. Just we haven't done it, but it's the, the formula is general, so you can, you can plug it in. Good question. It seems like the, the input data is the same GIS data Yes. Have you, have you generated traditional maps and then generated your map and then overlaid them and see where the agreement and disagreement is? Yeah, I, I hope that I got that uh, comment from our colleagues yesterday. But the thing is that when, once we got this thing, uh, it, it takes days for us to do the traditional thing, and I will do it. I will do it, but uh, because we have the final result, just it will be only for the comparison purposes. I will do it for sure. I haven't because we didn't require it anymore. Yeah, it might also be interesting to see, like, where, under what circumstances is a big disagreement. People could look back at their old Yes. And say, well, maybe of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's an, that's a, an, a next step too. Yes. Any other questions? You have my email there if you have a questions. You have a question, okay? Personally, my eyes glaze over every time I see a formula, so I think it's fantastic that, that people like Evaristo are, are working on these sort of things to give us useful tools that we can actually apply to, to uh, doing the work on the ground. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, due to particularly good timekeeping by our six speakers uh, in this session, we've uh, Finished a few minutes early, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, uh, there's a presentation by, by Bell Labs on their bait products at uh, 10 to 1, uh, going for half an hour or so, and then um, back in here for the afternoon session at uh, 1.30. And for those of you who are speaking uh, in that following session after lunch, could you please uh, make sure you introduce yourself to Carol West. Carol, do you want to um, say something?